Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24. Today I'm excited to take a look at the biggest matchup the chess world has to offer. It's Mr. 7 out of 7, Fabiano Caruana, against the triple world champion, the world champion in blitz chess, in rapid chess, and of course in classical chess, Magnus Carlsen. It is the world's number one, Magnus Carlsen, against the world's number two, Fabiano Caruana. Caruana with the white pieces. Here we see a picture of today's game. It is as big as it gets. This game is played in the sixth round of the Tata Steel Masters, the super tournament in Vaik Anze. Both players before the game had three out of five. We're not really in the lead, but we're close to the top position. So it is also, of course, an important game for the tournament standings. Let's jump into it and see what happened. Karana with white goes for the move 1e4 as he tends to do against Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen, in the last year, he has used the move e5, the move d5, and the move c5 against Karana. Lost with e5, won with d5, drew with c5, and he once again decides to play c5, the Sicilian defense, as he did in their last encounter in San Luis. Knight f3, knight to c6, and here bishop b5 from Fabiano Carana. First slight surprise for me, not because this is not a common move, but because it's not the move Carana chose last time against Carlsen, where he played d4, and I would also think that d4 is more in Carana style. It leads to more open position in open Sicilian, where deep opening preparation and calculation are a bit more important than after bishop b5, which often, of course, the game could go anywhere, but this often leads to a more maneuvering strategic type of position, which is more Magnus Carlsen's ballpark. Of course, these are the number one and number two in the world. They can play any position, but generally speaking, I would have expected d4 from Karana. However, if you're not prepared for this line or didn't expect Magnus Carlsen to go for the Sicilian today, it is quite a scary thought that Carlsen could go for the Sveshnikov, which he has used successfully in the past. The move e5 leads to very sharp, very concrete play. And you don't want to go for this unprepared, while bishop b5, you don't have to know every small detail. So if Karana was surprised, this is a very reasonable choice, of course. The so-called Rosso Limo. Main move here nowadays is e6, planning to go knight g e7. It's not the move Carlsen plays. He goes for g6, which has become a little bit less popular. e6, clearly the established main line now, but g6 is a very sound move and, of course, is played a lot as well, play, planning to go bishop g7. The reason it's less popular than e6 now is that this structure after bishop takes c6, which Karana plays in the game, is supposed to be a little more comfortable for white after d takes c6. Black has these double pawns, leads to a very slow maneuvering game, which is considered to be a bit more pleasant. I do agree with that assessment, but I also do think that Magnus Carlsen feels very much at home in a structure like this, and he has a lot of experience. Now you might wonder why I'm saying that, because he hasn't played this position all that much, but a position he has played a lot is the one after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, Knight f6, the good old Berlin. Here white often plays the move d3. Black replies with bishop c5. And now white goes bishop takes c6, d takes c6. And we can see this is a very, very similar structure. White gives his light squared bishop to double black's pawn. Black goes d takes c6. Black pawn is already on e5, but in the game position, the pawn ends up on e5 very often as well. Magnus Carlsen has played this position a lot with both colors and with excellent results. So I don't think he was particularly unhappy with this choice of line by Caruana. However, objectively, well not objectively, I believe common opinion is that white is a little better here. d3, bishop to g7, h3, typical move, stopping bishop g4 for good and also stopping a future knight f6, knight g4 because White often wants his bishop on e3. Knight to f6, knight to c3, and the move b6. This is not the theoretical main move, however, it shouldn't matter all that much. It's a useful move defending c5, which has to be done after the move bishop e3. 
Main line here is something like castles. Our bishop e3 and black normally chooses between the move b6 now and the move, I'm sorry, <coughs> knight to d7, planning e5. In general, let's have a brief look at the typical plans for either side. Can, might as well have it in this position. White, more often than not, he puts his bishop on e3, then he wants to go queen to d2 and have the option to exchange the bishops with bishop to h6. White normally castles king side. It's a bit risky to put your king on the queen side here because black might have a pawn storm, which you don't really want to encourage. So normally he castles king side, and then in the future he looks for a way to undermine the black pawn structure a little bit. One typical idea, let's get rid of the arrows before it becomes too many, is a3 followed by b4. We're gonna get into this later. Another idea is once the black pawn shows up on e5 to prepare a move like f4, undermining the f pawn, the e pawn, sorry. So these are the typical ideas white is working with. Well, for black, of course, he wants to castle. Then more often than not, he wants to put his pawn on e5 to gain influence in the center and also to stop white forever from going e5 or d4 himself. And then the problem black often addresses in these positions as first priority is the knight on f6 is not well placed. So typical plan is actually to go knight d7, then knight to f8, knight to e6, and knight to d4. Takes a lot of time, but if you can get it all in, that is a very decent idea. Another typical route is knight h5, ideally knight f4, knight e6, knight d4. So those are the plans both sides are working in. Move orders aren't that important. Still, I'm a bit surprised by Carlson's next move because I believe that it gives White a tactical chance which he normally would not have. It's the move e5 played, which of course opens him to the question what happens after knight takes e5. Now Carlson didn't miss that. After knight takes e5 there is the typical tactic, knight takes e4, winning back the pawn, and if White recaptures, black goes bishop takes e5 and is totally fine. But in this particular position, with the king still on e8, it seems to me that white had an interesting option here to go queen to f3, intending after bishop takes e5 to play queen takes e4. It's a nasty little double attack against the e5 bishop and the c6 pawn. I'm not sure how strong this would have been. f5 is probably the best move here for black. But at first sight, it does look like white has some interesting options here. Move bishop f4 is suggested by the computer. The kamikaze move knight takes g6 to give up this knight's life and then capture on e4 and win a pawn also comes into consideration. So this was a very interesting option which Carlson allowed by his move order by starting with the move e5 and which Karana did not go for but he did spend quite a bit of time on his next move so I'm sure he did consider it. After castles, castles the opportunity has passed. Now knight takes e5 is always well met with knight takes e4, so not really an option anymore. And we're back into very normal territory. Here Karana's next move is once again a small surprise. He goes for the move a3. It's much more common to start with queen to d2, keeping the option open to go bishop to h6, and then later to decide if you want to go a3 or if you want to go knight h2, f4. This is a very typical standard line. Black often goes knight h5, bishop h6, queen d6, knight to e2, something like f6. White is maybe, maybe a little bit better, but nothing much is happening, of course. Note that if these bishops should be exchanged, f5 is often not a good option anymore because the e5 pawn would become very weak. In the game, Karana decides to do without queen d2, plays a move a3, which interestingly prepares b4. Now you might wonder why would you want to go b4 getting rid of the black double pawns. But it turns out that these double pawns are actually quite useful controlling the center. And after a move like let's say rook e8, b4, c takes b, a takes b, the structure is actually transformed in white's favor. First of all his pieces are activated. This rook is very active on the half open a file. This bishop has a lot more scope now. It's having a look at the b6 pawn and also quite importantly black's grip on the d4 square is not very strong anymore so white has the option of going d4 in the future opening the position which often 
is a very decent resource. So this would be strategically desirable for white and black does not want to allow something like this. Of course, both players know this perfectly well. Carlsen starts with a move queen to e7, defending e5 and keeping an eye on the b4 square as well. Karana goes to extremes to achieve this b4 move now. He plays a move queen to b1, which looks strange. The queen almost always ends up on d2 in this line. Queen b1, the message is very clear. I want to get him b4. I understand how important this is for me and I'm willing to make some concessions for it. And putting the queen on b1 is a concession because it is very far away from action on the king's side, which is where Carlsen, of course, understanding this detail, reacts immediately, plays the move knight to h5, not only preparing the knight maneuver we saw earlier, but also maybe planning to play f5. Karana goes b4, of course this was his idea. And once again, c takes b4, not a good idea, because after a takes b4, white gets the structure he wants to get in this position. But Carlsen instead goes for it. He goes for the move f5, which is really almost going for broke, because he accepts very weakened pawns on the queen side and is saying, I don't care, I'm going to checkmate you on the king side. I'm going to push my kings up the board and create an attack there. So this really raises the stakes by quite a bit. A slightly more positional continuation was the move knight to f4. Once again, accepting these weak pawns, but then planning to put the knight on e6 and put it to d4, where the very strong black knight would probably compensate for the weakness of the queen side. Carlsen goes for f5, which is exciting for us spectators because it makes the game a lot more complicated. Karana goes b takes c5, not much else to do. And Carlsen plays the important Zwischenzug f4. Had he played b takes c5 immediately, white would go knight to a4, attacking the pawn on c5, planning bishop takes c5. So it was important to force this bishop away from the c5 square first f4, bishop d2, and now b takes c5. Note that once again, Carlsen has no interest in undoubling his pawns and going queen takes c5. Here, white would be slightly better after queen b4, some weaknesses in the black camp once again. Instead, he chooses to double his pawns, stay with these very weak pawns, but leave the queen on the board to support the kingside attack. And that's really what it's about now. White wants to attack the weaknesses on c6 and c5. Black wants to go g5, g4, start an attack. The question is who gets there first and how do you execute these plans? It's a lot easier to play with black because g5, g4, there's only one way to execute it. While attacking these pawns, there's a couple of options. Knight a4, for example, was an option, tending something like queen b2, queen, queen to c3. And Karana instead goes for the move queen b3 check, spent a lot of time around here, so he was already approaching time trouble, which does not make it easier to play a position like this. Bishop e6, queen a4, this was the idea. The queen gains the c6 pawn and also gains control of some more squares on the queen side. Stays far away from the king side, however. c6 pawn had to be defended. Carlsen goes rook a c8, the most economical way to cover it. Queen stays on e7 to prepare g5, g4. Rook on f8 might also find work on the king side later on. Once again, Karana faces a tough decision how to best arrange his pieces. Many moves are possible here. Rook fb1 was an option, planning something like queen to a6, followed by rook b7. I think it's becoming a bit too many arrows, so let's get rid of them. But rook fb1 was very possible. Queen a6 immediately was very possible. Karana decides on the move queen a5, also very sensible, planning knight a4 to attack the c5 pawn. And as I said, Carlsen's position is easier to play. He is committed to the attack anyway, and he goes g5, planning to open up the king side. By the way, don't be surprised if your computer in this position, and for quite a while, gives a significant white advantage. He is wrong. Computers have a problem understanding the power of these long-term attacks with g5, g4, and what trouble the white king could find itself in. Well, it's easier to understand that these pawns are in trouble. So your computer will say white is better until he understands how dangerous the black attack is. And in my opinion, I'm not sure black is better here. I'm sure his position is easier to play. 
but Black has full compensation for his weakened queenside at the very least. Knight a4 is played, attacking the pawn on c5, which can't and shouldn't be defended. Instead, g4, of course, opening the g-file. Karana goes h takes g4. He could have played the cunning queen takes c5 with the idea that after queen takes c5, knight takes c5, this knight attacks the bishop on e6, so it doesn't matter that his own knight is under attack. And white is better in the ending. But in reality, queen takes c5 would just have transposed to the game because black would have gone queen f6 and we would have gotten the same position we get in the game where Karana first took on g4, bishop takes, now played queen takes c5 and Carlsen went queen f6. Computers prefer queen e6, but I don't think Carlsen considered that for more than a second because black does not want to exchange queens here and queen e6 allows queen c4 after which the queens disappear from the board because of the pin. So queen f6, and now it's time to have a look at why I've been praising the black attack so much. It does not look that scary, but it's one of these long-term King's Indian style attacks where all of a sudden you can be in trouble. Of course, the most direct threat is bishop takes f3, exposing this king. But there's also slower ideas like rook f7, bishop f8, rook g7, queen to g6. This knight could be very useful on h5, can sometimes sacrifice itself on g3. And it's much easier to attack than to defend here. White has a couple of options. I'm going to show you one line which I found very aesthetically pleasing. Rook fb1 is a natural move. The rook occupies the open file and it prepares for this king to run to the center should it get into trouble. But turns out that white is losing here already. After queen g6, king f1, there is the hammer blow, knight g3 check. After f takes g3, I'm not sure, probably f takes g3 actually is a mistake. Maybe king e1 is more resilient. f takes g3, there is no defense. This king will get hunted down. Prettiest line is king e2, queen h5, king to d1, trying to run away. Nothing else helps, trust me. Queen h1 check, bishop to e1 forced. And here my favorite move of this line, and the reason I'm showing it, the nasty move, bishop h6, occupying this diagonal where the king was hoping to find an escape route. Now it's just game over. Rook f3 is a threat, bishop f3, queen f3 is a threat, queen g2 is a threat. There's just no way out. So this is one line that goes to show how quickly the black attack can catch speed. According to the computer, white should have gone rook fe1 here when such ideas don't seem to work yet. However, I do believe that black has very pleasant play after rook f7, planning bishop f8, rook g7, bishop g3, bishop f3, queen g6, so many options. I think black is fine. And I think practically Karana made the best choice here. He played knight h2, not allowing any funny business with bishop f3 now or in the future. He didn't allow any funny business with bishop f3. He did allow the very funky move f3 though, which is the move chosen by Carlsen and also the best move. Queen h4 might have looked more natural, but white stays in the game here with knight g4, queen g4, and the very strong defensive move Queen to e7. This looks strange, but it stops or defends against the black threat f3 because there is queen to g5 and all of a sudden the queen defends against the mate on g2 from behind. Very nice little idea. While the other reason queen e7 is a very strong move is that after bishop f6 or any move attacking the queen really, white has the intermediate move f3 in turn attacking the black queen which has to go somewhere, let's say g3. And now there is queen e6 check followed by queen g4 or queen h3 if needed, including the white queen in the defense. So queen h4 wasn't that good. The move played by Carlsen is the best move, f3, a piece sacrifice. Knight takes g4, queen to g6, and it turns out that Carlsen is not gonna stay a piece down for a very long time because there is no way that White can save this knight on g4. If he tries to keep it by going knight e3, 
He will remain a piece up, but he will lose his king, knight to f4, threatening knight takes g2, and another little thing. White goes g3 to stop that threat. There is knight e2, check, king h2, queen h5, and checkmate. Of course, Karana is not the number two in the world and arguably the best calculator in the world for nothing. He saw all this and found the only way to stay in the game to defend the very strong move queen to e7. Once again, planning to meet queen takes g4 with queen g5. So instead, Carlsen chose another move. Let's switch, if we have it, to the video of this position where Carlsen is contemplating his next move. Here we are, here we got the two players. Carlsen plays, f takes g2. Looks reasonably confident if you ask me as the body language doctor that I am. But Carlsen always looks pretty confident. Karana, I'm not sure. It's easy to say he looks scared and troubled, but he actually does look pretty calm as well. So it's hard to read too much into it. Let's go back to the game after f takes g2. White has to defend and has reason to be scared, but Karana is very, very good at it and he plays the best move. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Rook f to b1. Once again, banking on this idea after queen g4 to play queen g5 and to offer the exchange of queens. This is another interesting moment. Karana has defended very well and has managed to maintain the equilibrium. And Carlsen could have considered Repeating moves here with queen e2, he does that once, queen e3, forced to defend against queen takes f2, queen g4, queen g5, this is played in the game. Carlsen could have made a draw by going back with queen e2, but he wouldn't be Magnus Carlsen if he would not look for a way to win this game, and he does, he continues by playing queen takes g5, bishop takes g5, and knight to f4. When we have a completely new phase of the game, we have an ending. Pawns are equal, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not that good at counting. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 against 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Pawns are equal. And black has a lot of isolated pawns, but black also has a lot of activity. And he has a passed pawn on the h-file, while this pawn on g2 is still on the board. Very, very complicated situation. For now, the black threat is knight h3 check, winning the bishop. And this is the position where Karana, after his heroic defense over the last couple moves, crumbles and commits a very serious mistake, which also can be blamed on his time troubles. He did not have a lot of time here to evaluate everything. He goes for bishop takes f4, evaluate, <laughs> evaluating, <laughs> evacuating, <laughs> taking the knight on f4 out of the game. <clears throat> But it was not a good idea. What he should have done is to play the move king to h2, just stopping the threat knight h3 check by using his king only, following the good old Steinitz maxim, the former world champion, that the king is a strong piece that can look after himself. This position would have been true, and it looks like this position is still dynamically balanced. In fact, it wouldn't be that surprising if the game ended here with yet another move repetition. Bishop f6, bishop h6, bishop g7, bishop g5. However, Karana decided to take on f4, and he, of course, put some thought into it. After e takes f4, it looks like this is suicide. The bishop is attacking the, pawn, the rook on a1. f3 is a threat, but Karana's idea is the very interesting exchange sacrifice, king takes g2. Now it's logical for black to start with f3 check just to stop the white king coming to f3 in any case, f3, king f1. And here it turns out that if black were to take the exchange, bishop a1, rook a1, white is actually in pretty decent shape because he has a very simple plan. He wants to bring his king to e3 where it's very well placed, keeping an eye on the f3 pawn. Then he would have a pawn for the exchange and all black pawns would be extremely weak and hard to attack. So this would have been a decent option. I'm not sure who's better and why in this position. My best guess, it's roughly equal. But Carlsen shows why he is the world champion, why he is the most feared endgame player of our time and plays an insanely strong move. The move rook to f4, which frankly, I'm not sure I would even have considered this let this rook live on a1 and just go for the initiative. 
Rook F4 introduces a lot of ideas of Rook H4 followed by Rook H1 and checkmate. It also finally keeps an eye on the E4 pawn, which looks like it's very well defended, but this will be a factor. It turns out after Rook F4 that White has already lost his defenseless. The main reason is the move King E1 once again looks very logical, planning to bring this king into safety to avoid being checkmated with Rook H4, Rook H1. But here Black has an amazing move at his disposal, the move Rook to D8. This is a horribly strong move. It's prophylaxis. You stop the king from going to D2 because now King D2 runs into Rook takes E4 and due to the pin White cannot recapture, rook e2 is a threat, and let's not forget this. Rook on a1 is still under attack, so it can still be taken. Rook to d8 would have been an incredibly strong move. I'm not sure if this was Carlsen's intention. Bishop h6 instead of rook d8 was also pretty strong to stop king d2 as well, but rook d8 would just have finished the game pretty much instantly. It's very possible Karana saw this and he saw what had happened now after rook f4. He tried instead to play the move c3 to keep this rook out of danger on a1. But once again, Carlsen goes for the move rook d8, attacking this newly created weakness here. Sorry, weird arrow on d3. And the game is pretty much over, surprisingly. The white army is just too passive to withstand the onslaught of the black pieces, which are tremendously active. Rook takes d3 is a threat for starters, but there is always the idea of rook h4 in the air as well. Not much white can do. He chooses the, pawn, the move pawn to d4. Nothing really works. For example, rook to d1, let's say, runs into rook a4, threatening rook h1 checkmate. And if king e1, there is the very nasty and cruel bishop h6. Seen this idea earlier, stopping king to d2. Next move is rook h1 and it's mate. While if white goes the other way, king g1, his king will also not find a lot of happiness in this particular position. Rook d6 followed by rook g6 just finishes him off. So there's nothing white can do. Caruana tried to move d4 to at least keep the d-file closed and still hoping to hide his king here somewhere, but it was not enough. Bishop to h6. Once again, a nice little move directed against king e1, king d2, which is no longer possible and still planning the very nasty rook h4. There was an even crueler way to end the game here. It is a bit computer-esque, but I still want to show it because it's very pretty. It's the move bishop takes d4. White recaptures and now rook to h4. Once again, threatening mate. And whatever white does, he gets checkmated. King g1, there is very pretty rook, king to h8, next move rook g8, then rook h1, let's checkmate, then king to e1, there's a simple rook takes d4, stopping the white king from running to the d-file, and rook h1 can once again not be stopped. So that would have ended the game immediately, but the move Carlsen plays is very strong as well, bishop h6, just not allowing the white king to get where it wants to get. King e1, the king has to run anyway, rook takes e4 check, king d1, and Carlsen plays the next hammer blow. This one is easier to understand, but pretty nonetheless, the move c5. Why c5? Black wants to go rook to e2, but the problem with rook e2 immediately is that white goes rook to b2 and he manages to defend along the second rank for now. Well, after c5, if White plays the only sensible move, knight takes c5, now rook e2 just decides the game. There's no rook b2 or rook a2 anymore because this knight no longer covers the b2 square. And black is just winning. Rook d2 is a threat, rook f2 is a threat. There's absolutely nothing white can do to stick around here. So Karana realized that and he tried king to c2 instead, but that is pretty much desperation because if you lose this pawn, all black pieces keep operating at maximum capacity. Rook e2 still can't be stopped. So the game is pretty much over here. After c takes d4, king to d3, rook to e2, once again attacking the f2 pawn, c4, rook takes f2, rook d1, and let's 
switch back into the game to see the final stage if the players decide to make a move for us. <coughs> Here we are, <coughs> Carlsen considering his options. I believe he will move quickly. There is many ways that lead to Rome here, of course. The world champion chooses the quickest one. It's gonna make us wait though. Come on, make a move, Magnus. We don't have time all day. Here we go. He plays the move, rook to e2, which activates his pieces to the max, planning to go rook e3 check, making way for both the f-pawn and the d-pawn. And Karana had seen enough, resigned the game here. Let's have a very brief look at why, but it's really self-evident. He's two pawns down, rookie two check is coming, and then the d-pawn and the f-pawn are running. The wide position is totally hopeless. So Magnus Carlsen wins that matchup, which is the biggest matchup there is. He defeats the world number two, Fabian Karana, moves to four points out of six in Baikansee, which is very close to the top of the tournament, while Karana falls back to three out of six after he started with two out of two. Things haven't gone well for the Italian over the last couple of rounds. Magnus Carlsen, on the other hand, has scored three wins in a row, defeated Van Veli, defeated Aronian, and today he defeated Fabiano Carana with the black pieces, which is the biggest matchup there is, at least if you're Magnus Carlsen yourself and you can't play against Magnus Carlsen. Another chapter in their rivalry. Congratulations to Magnus Carlsen. If you want to learn more about the Karana against Carlsen rivalry, check out my video series together with Lawrence Trent on their games, their history, their future. For now, Carlsen delivers the next blow, and I'm sure this has not been the last we've heard of these two players. Thanks a lot for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.